Great, so it's now the moment uh, to introduce Ryan Trekartin. Ryan Trekartin is an artist born in Webster, Texas in 1981. Many of you will have seen his extraordinary work at the last year's uh, Venice uh, Biennale. He has an itinerant practice, has lived between geographies in Rhode Island, in New Orleans, in Ohio, in Philadelphia, in Miami, and more recently in Los Angeles, where I visited his studio. He very often has a collaborative uh, practice, has worked ever since he's a student with the artist Lizzie Fitch, but with many, many other uh, artists and uh, practitioners. Um, it's fascinating that his name was omnipresent in the last two DLDs, because we organized two years ago the conference uh, Way Beyond the Internet, um, where many artists referred to him. We had last year the 89 Plus conference, which we co-curated with Simon Gaste about the uh, generation of artists born in 89 and younger. And that idea was very much based on an idea of Ryan. And Ryan once said that we should really look at the extraordinary artists who are born in the 1990s, this extraordinary generation of artists who has grown up uh, with uh, the internet. Ryan will present here some uh, short films today and we will have a conversation. So please give a very, very warm welcome to Ryan Trekartin. Do you want to stand? Sure, yeah. So, we're going to start with a clip. It's actually a trailer for an older project called Any Ever that um, was made between 2008 and 2011. So, here's the trailer. Being post-family and pre-hotel ends today for me. Did you not identify with the girl? There's nothing wrong with stopping things early. Adobe, do you think Brett would be mad if we stopped the premise early? Yeah, yeah, but... Jamie, I just found out I'm driving! Can I I am not the only style to do that stuff. I've been a CEO since birth. I want that. Just and as if. Sense me now. Cedar, my advice to you. I can't wait until they invent concept camo. I'm gonna go wash off this big offense and fuck up a tanning bag. People, <laughs> look at what I use. People, merch, merch, merch. Oh, I love acid. Cute. Hey, bitch. All I'm saying is. Capitulation is sexy when you land on the right vibration. And together, we're told. Very hard to be transparent. There are no people. I create and GI. I love redistributing myself because I haven't learned enough yet. Where's Globally? Is this no doubt? I mean, I don't know what to do. I also made this. I'm describing a personality trait. I owned a pretty rad, exchangeable, racially aggressive body parts. Am I over existing or am I over existing? Smile and such What? I'm really into the third world right now. I collect things. I just designed an airplane that has ashtrays in it. Can you believe that ashtray? I'm sure. Are we still in prison? I love being in places that mean nothing to me. Now I can take this memory without fear of further utilizing it. Oh no, baby, I hate it. The possibilities pretend to be but they're actually, I'm gonna bounce. Burn down the house, mail me a hotel. This is the trailer for your amazing Gesamtkunstwerk at MoMA PS1 three years ago. Before we talk about that and some other of your recent work, I thought it would be interesting to talk uh, about your beginnings. How did it all start? How did you come to art, or how did I come to you? Uh, well, when I was younger, I, I primarily did dance and costume making, and sort of like making games with my friends. I didn't know, I didn't really know about the contemporary art world until we moved to a farm town outside of Toledo, and the high school there didn't have all the sort of like drama and dance departments that. I was involved in, in the school before, and there was this awesome art teacher there who kind of pointed out that 
all these things could be potentially used in contemporary art, and she sh show showed me about art school, and I decided to apply to them. And when I got to RISD is sort of like when I, I always knew I wanted to make movies, but it was there that I realized that there would be a home, sort of, for the kinds of movies I wanted to make, because that's how. Yeah. And <laughs> earlier today when we spoke, I asked you a question, you know, I often ask artists, who are your kind of, you know, inspirations? Panofsky once said, often we, you know, invent the future made out of fragments from the past, and you gave a very unexpected answer, because you said it's not necessarily, you know, people who influenced you or, you know, artists, it was more behaviors. Can you maybe talk a little bit about this? Yeah, I mean, I feel like when I uh, look at different sort of works of culture or things that people contribute to the world, I don't necessarily look at it as like an author-based thing. And so I like accumulating sort of, uh, sort of a more associative like mess of an understanding of how all these things are interconnected. And so I think that I'm more inspired by behaviors and the way things are utilized and the way people um, turn their sort of like accumulated sense of like an understanding of a particular behavior or a way of saying something or a way of communicating sort of into like a source of inspiration. Like, I think that that's sort of... Yeah. And something which starts very early is the kind of collaborative uh, practice. You met Lizzie Fitch already, you know, as a student, and that's a collaboration which has lasted ever since. Can you maybe talk about this? Because it's something which you've always emphasized is incredibly important. Yeah, I mean, I think the nature of movie making is just like inherently collaborative. But I, I met uh, Lizzie Fitch, who's an artist in 2000, and we've been collaborating in a lot of different ways ever since. Uh, we also make sculptures and sculptural theaters and other different kinds of artworks, not just movies. Um, but the, the movies themselves have a whole sort of like system of different kinds of collaboration within them. Uh, it can be anything from like collaborating on uh, the wardrobe or the set or like a prop component or an accent or a behavior. And, you know, there's credits at the end of the movie that kind of explain all that. But collaboration is really important to me because I'm more interested in creating like a landscape of possibilities rather than executing a vision. And so I write a script. Um, but then I feel like the set making process is a script writing process as well, and the prop making and the wardrobe and the casting is all scripts, and then they come together at a certain moment, and the way that they combine through the process of shooting um, creates supplies, and there's unexpected possibilities that happen when you're collaborating that don't happen when you're sort of dictating. And your work starts in the early 2000s with your, with your videos, but when I ask you if that's the beginning of your catalog resume, of your kind of over catalog, you said, no, it starts much earlier. Kind of goes back to your childhood? Well, kind of. <laughs> I didn't really understand the question at first, but I, yeah, I think that like the, the sort of games that you play when you're a kid are so, a lot of like, those experiences are what I draw from and how to like organize collaboration. And before we talk about the, uh, you know, the clip we saw and then the more recent work, maybe a few more things on your, on your early work, because already in your very early movies you, you used a lot of low-tech elements, you, you also used iMovie, and uh, um, can you talk a little bit about the kind of technology you, you started with and then how it changed? Yeah, I shot a lot of footage in high school and, and middle school, but I, I didn't know uh, sort of a prosumer or accessible way of editing it at that time. And when I got to uh, college, I, I found out about iMovie, and that kind of just opened a ton of doors, and, and I was able to start editing. So iMovie, like, for a long time was the main software that I used, and then I, I got into After Effects, and I use After Effects kind of in a little bit of an off-label way. It's, I, I like, I, I edit in it, even though it's a post sort of software, um, because it's, it doesn't play in real time, and so you have to focus a lot on like looking at the sound waves and sort of scrolling through 
every action, and it's actually like a creates a much slower pace of editing, which I think brings out more ideas in the process. And so I'm actually not that interested in like super fast pace multi linear forms of editing. I really like the cold slow of using a software that's not supposed to be for editing. And you sort of found your language in terms of, you know, filming with lots of different ways, with the multiple cameras, also with post-production, with having more to do with writing, with the family finds entertainment. Uh, can you tell us what happened in that, in that film? Because it's something gets anticipated there, which has continued ever since. Well, A Family Finds Entertainment was the first m movie where I worked with all these different forms of collaboration that I, that I work with now. And it's also the first time that I wrote um, a script, a full script for it, and sort of thought of it as a, as a movie rather than just a video. And there's also this multilinearity in it. Kevin McGarry says that, I mean, it's not non-linearity, but it's kind of multilinearity, which all this film has, and that's very much true for the Any Ever, you know, trailer. We saw, can you talk a little bit about this kind of multilinearity and the way the sort of, you know, multiple storylines evolve? Yeah, I, th I think that there's a way to read the work that feels very non-linear, but they're structured in, in sort of like a mesh of linearities, and uh, people often act, of, act as vehicles, or um, props act as vehicles or threads through sort of a form that's a plot. And depending on how you're approaching the movies or how many times you're watching them, there's different sort of storylines or plots that sort of congeal and come forward as you sort of read it. Like, I, I kind of think it's something that you would read more like a poem. And when I say read, I'm kind of thinking more about using all your different understandings of culture and all your different isms and um, to sort of like access the work and dissect it. And I, a lot of times, I think that the, the, the linearities sort of form in the act of like remembering the work um, memorization's like a big part of how the plots form. And there is also velocity, and I mean, what we saw any ever, uh, you know, is part of that very fast-paced, uh, um, fast-paced work. And you once said that you love the idea uh, of technology and culture moving faster than the understanding of actually those uh, um, mediums for people, and that sort of, uh, I mean, energy drinks play a really important sure. role in your films, uh, as here at DLD, where we have a lot of energy drinks in the building. Can you tell us a little bit about energy drinks, uh, velocity, speed, fast, <laughs> fast films? Well, I mean, the shoots, everyone's drinking energy drinks because they're really long, and we, should, we do them at night. But I... Um, I think that people get a lot on a really instinctual, intuitive level, and I think the most inventive ideas pop out um, when people don't have time to think about what they're doing. And I think reflection is really important, and I think that that's sort of the editing process. And so when I'm shooting, I, I like to put the, the shoot in a state of panic somewhat. Not necessarily, like in a neutral sense, I'm not, not like where, you know, people are <laughs> freaking out, but um, the sort of associations that people come up with when things are moving faster than their ability to, di to digest them is really, I think, inventive. And, and it happens a lot in culture with the way people use technologies before they understand the implications of them or before they even learn like what the actual function of a particular app is supposed to be. A lot of times what people just start doing is more interesting than what it was originally designed for. And an idea of panic is there is, you know, Jodorowsky, Alejandro Jodorowsky, who did The Holy Mountain, uh, he, he's now in his 70s, and he founded a movement called Panic Movement. Uh, and I went to see him the other day, and we spoke about this idea of exploration and that maybe exploring ideas and not judging them. And it was kind of interesting because that's almost a sentence which could be from you, that you kind of enjoy exploring ideas more than judging them. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I, 
I just, I think the exploration of something, I don't know, I, I think that like um, contradictory approaches to something or contradictory or even somewhat opposite feelings about something can, co can coexist within the same form. And I think like a movie in particular is a great opportunity to um, explore something rather than ju to, to judge it. And one more thing which, uh, before we speak about the more recent film and what you're gonna show us towards the end, one more thing which pops up in all of these films is this idea that it's not so much about characters being impersonated, but more what you call kind of possibilities, to posit possibilities. Can you tell us a little bit about that, that sort of aspect of not impersonating characters? Yeah, I mean, I think that in, well, with Any Ever, which is what the trailer was for, I was thinking of sort of personality traits and behaviors and um, genders and roles and identities and all that stuff as um, t tools or applications rather than like um, sort of ways of existing. And I think that a lot of the characters in, in the movies are trying to sort of like invent new territory or sort of create um, realities and maintain them um, through through being in proximity to other things, and so not necessarily needing a dichotomy or an, an otherness to, to exist, and sort of allowing uh, sort of a state of inventiveness to not depend on opposites or, or like th 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 labels, like labels being more of an application or a tool rather than a an ultimate definition. Now also in any ever there is a lot of uh, elements of you know marketing research, there is what uh, um, Lauren Cornell calls in her text issues of, tra of transhumanist economy. The film was made actually at the moment of the financial crisis around 2008-2010 and you were telling me earlier today over coffee that it's a very American idea of the internet which the film kind of has. Yeah I mean I think that a lot of people like talk about it being like a very global space, but I, I think from what I see of the internet that I use, it feels very American. And I feel like these like approaches to discussing um, a more expanded re inclusive reality are I think really like artful, but they aren't necessarily activated. And um, Yeah, I, I think that like a, like a lot of times in, in the work, I try to like take something like a commercial, like a car commercial and try to like, is there a way to make this into, uh, you know, a personality trait? Or how can I take that behavior or that sort of like role, like, you know, the, the it girl or like the mean girl in a high school movie and sort of make that like an, an aesthetic of a room and this sort of like substitution process. And also one of the things which leads us to the more recent work which you showed in Venice, and that's my last question before we see you know, the last film you're gonna show us, is that you work on these projects for several years. It's very much like a Gesamtkunstwerk, it's a total work of art. It exists in all kinds of ramifications. You put them all on the internet. It exists as big sculptural installations as we saw in Venice or at MoMA PS1 in the case of any ever. So I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about this aspect of the sort of, you know, the total work of art, these installations, uh, and maybe lead us from any ever into this Venice installation, which as you, yeah, I think we can't yet give a title to it. There isn't a title yet. The title comes always at the end. Yeah. Yeah, I always, I always title things after they're finished because I feel like it's, the name is a good opportunity to, to give a jumping off point and to help people sort of start somewhere in observing and like interacting with whatever it is and with uh, what was the question? Yeah, sort of the 
leading it to the Venice installation, and yeah. uh, because we're going to see another clip after the any ever of that Venice installation, and you know that was again a very sculptural piece. It was a huge oh, installation yeah. in the Arsenale. Yet it's not finished. It's going to continue to grow. Yeah. Well, the movies I, I, I make them all to be native to multiple exhibition spaces, and it's important that they exist in all of them at the same time. And there isn't like one way of approaching the work, so it's, it's important to see it like in a theater way or in a sculptural way or on the internet. And the, I just starting this new body of work. Um, there's four movies that are done so far, and there was an installation at Venice called Priority Infield. And the clip that we're gonna show is from a movie called Item Falls. And in the, in the new body of work, I, I, I went back and started editing footage from, that I shot in high school. And it was before I was writing scripts, so it was a little bit more um, documentary style or something, but I was really shocked at the way people's sort of relationship to, to the camera was very different back then, and I had no, I just don't re remember people feeling the way that they do, because that was before being able to upload video, um, or not upload it, but to be able to stream it, and it was before, um, at least in my town, people were social networking, and um, everyone's like, why do you have a camera? Are you gonna narc on us? And everything was about, like they couldn't see to po think of the possibility of like other uses for it. I mean, you couldn't really take video with your phone yet. But this clip is not from a high school movie. It's from Item Falls, where which the form of this movie is a, is an animation think tank, and like one of the ideas behind it is that they're talking a lot about um, dinosaurs evolving into chickens and the domestication of like evolution and. Um, people are evolving into animations, and no one has like a name yet in this because everyone's just a basic item and are waiting to be conjugated. Um, and so this clip is sort of a, a moment where uh, a character that doesn't have a name is talking about her producer and her stunt chickens. Great, so let's watch the film and Ryan. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks. you. One of the most significant animations yet. Right, I think these chickens are ready for stars. It is so realistic. The textures are unbelievable. <laughs> when I run the food, I have the industry standards. Now we're gonna do some chicken trust falling. I'm about to make these chickens disappear. But before I do, I gotta tell a little story. Once upon an industry standard, it's one of my best animations. Oh, I went to the other animation studio and I saw a real even though you are my producer, I have to say I have been educated in many places, and I'm not done. The most fun auditions I've had yet. I said, oh, <laughs> Lord damn bitch! Like, look at this, for real. I would say hi I would say hi I would say hi I, I, I am so good at my dial. Possibly. Time for the show After she climbs the ladder. This, this time. I'm gonna drink a bouquet by myself. Then I'm gonna die. Time to see the other friend solo. My solo is more of a story. And it involves two of my friends that it evolves. And the last time that these people were in my life, I had two baby stock chickens. But since then, they have moved on. My industry raising chicken standards believes that the chickens must fall off of high hats first. Because I believe in stunt chickens that work hard for a living. Look at that 
chicken over the ladder. <laughs> I'll dish him that. The last time I was here, that's all that. They gave me a dog cup. Check him out. Oh, my God. Oh, oh ladder. <laughs> Girls used to call me, so I understand how the physics of the ladder works. And later in night, I don't become friends with them. Fuck. Daddy! Daddy! I'm registered this game. Oh, get the hell on the road. Oh, I. Not smart. Boy, <laughs> But I want to see the industry uh, stand up, prop uh, chicken developers, and sound about, talk about, and sound out about uh, chicken, regular chicken, and uh, de development. This is the one level where nobody has names, and it's significant because it's about animation. <laughs> I stole him, you ain't taking And that's the ending, so I'm going to be and drink your back. And Ryan, before we now ask our panelists on stage, I do have a last question. It's my only recurring question in all the interviews. And I never asked you this question, so I kind of urgently need to ask you, do you have any unrealized projects? Projects which have been too big to be realized, dreams, utopias? Um, I, I really want to sort of challenge my idea of the, the form of the movie more, and I, I'm... I want to work with cameras that are able to sort of like capture an entire space in a 360 way so that I can edit um, space and sort of create uh, the pace of the movie sort of after the fact rather than deciding where the shots are while we're shooting. So creating more of a 360 environment for capturing a movie. And I think that it would be really interesting to sort of merge uh, the way games work a little bit more with the form of the movie and um, sort of create like different modes for experiencing a movie, like um, using, thinking of movies maybe more as uh, uh, like a bucket of content that gets mined through different ways of, different modes. So like uh, not so much like choose your own adventure, but more of figuring out some sort of like intuitive way to navigate the work and have like agency and experiencing it, but not, not so far as to turning it completely into a game so that it's still a movie, if that makes sense. But I feel like that would involve working with, you know, programmers and um, cameras that can do things that the cameras I currently have can't. <laughs> That's actually absolutely perfect because that is the transition to our panel because it leads us right away to the topic of you know, presets and post-sets. Ryan, thank you very, very much. Thanks, Thanks a lot.